the Lord makes a new covenant with us. We are God's people. The Lord is our God. Good morning and welcome to worship here at Union Presbyterian Church. My name is Pastor Andy Davis, and it is my delight to be leading you in worship this morning through the gift of technology and the power of the Holy Spirit. Two quick announcements. Next Sunday is Palm Sunday. We will have worship here on YouTube at the usual time. Following worship, please gather at the church and we will have a Palm Sunday parade around the church starting around 1115. So please be here before then. At the conclusion of our Palm Sunday parade, we will have some goodies. The following Sunday, of course, is Easter and we will be worshiping outside at Minnesota Square Park. And I imagine that we will record and post that service on YouTube. On Monday, Thursday and Good Friday at 7 p.m., we will also have worship services for Holy Week here on YouTube. Let us prepare our hearts and minds to worship God. Almighty God, our Redeemer, in our weakness we have failed to be your messengers of forgiveness and hope. Renew us by your Holy Spirit, that we may follow your commands and proclaim your reign of love. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. This is the proof of God's great love, that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Trusting in God's grace, let us confess our sin. God of mercy, you sent Jesus Christ to seek and save the lost, we confess that we have strayed from you and turned aside from your way. We are misled by pride, for we see ourselves pure when we are stained, and great when we are small. We have failed in love, neglected justice, and ignored your truth. Have mercy, O God, and forgive our sin. Return us to paths of righteousness, through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Listen, so that you may live. The steadfast love of the Lord never fails. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Let us continue to confess and ask for God's forgiveness as we listen to this musical offering.
lesson this morning comes to us from Jeremiah, chapter 31, beginning with verse 31. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors, when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. This striking and, I hope, familiar passage from the prophet Jeremiah grabs our attention because we see in it the heart of the gospel here in the Hebrew scriptures. Here is that promise for the forgiveness of sins, the promise that despite our sins, God will keep the covenant with us forever, that forever God will be our Lord, and that we will be God's people. This, this promise, this, this good news is the foundation of our faith, a faith that we as Christians find fulfilled in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So this is a kind of meat and potatoes theology, the basic bits, the stuff that keeps us going when life gets us down. And it is appropriate that we examine this message during this season of Lent, because Lent is a time when we look forward to, anticipate, and follow Jesus to the cross when we remember his sacrifice, his suffering, and his death. And when, like the disciples, we abandon Jesus, Jesus never abandoned us. And on the third day, he rose from the dead, conquering sin, forgiving our inequities, and granting us life in his resurrection. This, the gospel of Jesus Christ, is what we look forward to as Christians in the season of Lent. So how appropriate to look back at this ancient text as we look forward to Holy Week and Easter Sunday. It is, in a sense, this message, an echo that has come to us, that has reverberated to us down through the millennia, the centuries, down from text to preacher to teacher, down to our ears today, all the way back, all the way back to Jeremiah and the promises of a new covenant. So let's examine this text carefully. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors, when I took them by their hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. Again, in Jeremiah, God reminds us that God, the Lord, rescued God's people, liberated the Jews from captivity, from slavery in Egypt, brought them across the desert, gave them the law, the Ten Commandments commanded them that they must keep the law and brought them across the Jordan River 
to the promised land. That the Lord, the God who did these great things, who brought them salvation, made a covenant with them. A covenant is like a contract that a sovereign, a king, makes with the sovereign's people. If you obey my laws, then I will be your king. If you obey my statutes and my ordinances, says the Lord, then I will be your God. So God, our liberator, gives us God's divine law so that God can form a community of justice and of righteousness. A community, a covenanted nation, where people treat each other as God has treated us, where we treat one another as neighbors, as ones whom we love with dignity and respect, respect for their well-being in the world. And, and this way that we treat one another, the way that we treat our neighbors, and the way that we treat the stranger, the alien, the foreigner among us, is how we treat God. This theology of the covenant is made clear in the book of Deuteronomy, the second giving of the law, much earlier in the Hebrew scriptures. I'm going to read a bit from Deuteronomy chapter 28. Notice this first word, if, if you will only obey the Lord your God by diligently observing all his commandments that I am commanding you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth and all blessings shall come upon you and overtake you if you obey the Lord your God. If we keep the ordinances, the statutes, the laws of God's commands, then God will bless us, will bless God's people. And then there's a whole section here in Deuteronomy chapter 28 of blessings. Blessed shall you be in the city and blessed shall you be in the field. Blessed shall be the fruit of your womb, the fruit of your ground, the fruit of your livestock, both the increase of your cattle and the issue of your flock blessed, and so on and so on and so forth. A whole list of blessings that God will bless God's people with if they keep their end of the covenantal agreement. God will be their God. But then in verse 15 of this same chapter, we find a warning. But if you will not obey the Lord your God by diligently observing all his commandments and decrees which I am commanding you today. Then all these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. If God's people did not keep the ordinances, if they broke the law, then God's blessings would turn to curses. And then there's a whole long list of cur curses. Cursed shall you be in the city, and cursed shall you be in the field. Cursed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Cursed shall be the fruit of your womb, the fruit of your ground, the increase of your cattle, and the issue of your flock, and so on and so forth. So under this theology, the people of God knew that they had to keep the ordinances to keep God as their, the Lord as their God, and they had to maintain that relationship with God to ensure God's continued blessing. But then, in roundabouts the 7th century BC, a tragedy struck Israel and Judah. Four nations overran them, first the northern kingdom, then the southern kingdom. And the leaders were carried away into exile. And while in exile, these leaders, including scribes and theologians, had to contemplate what had happened. For it seemed that they had been abandoned by God, that God had allowed these foreign empires to conquer them. That the land which had once been a land of plenty 
had been burned and turned to fields of suffering and of starvation. And they understood what had happened to them, to the destruction of their nation and to their own exile through that chapter in Deuteronomy. And they understood that they had broken the ordinances of the Lord, that they had not loved their neighbors as they ourselves, that they had not loved and worshiped God alone. And so while in exile, they were full of regret, they were in a confessional, penitential state of mind. And they, and they turned to God for hope. And Jeremiah preached, the days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. It will not be like the prior covenant, but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. God will write God's law on our hearts. So no longer the law being an external expectation, which we can't live up to, but rather we find that God has written God's law, God's ordinances on our souls, on, our, on the core of our being. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, know the Lord, because everyone will know God from the least to the greatest, the youngest to the oldest, everyone says the Lord, for, for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. If the theology of Deuteronomy, the theology of the first covenant was based on the word if, if you keep my law, then I will bless you. In Jeremiah, the language is inverted and it says, God will keep the covenant and will continue to bless God's people for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. We, as God's people, sin. We are imperfect. We sin in collective ways for the often disturbing stories of history. We sin in personal ways when we treat other people as objects, when we treat each other with malice or hatred. We sin when we ignore our God and turn our backs on God. Yet, God remembers our sin no more. Our relationship with God is not based on an if that is contingent upon our own fidelity to the covenant, but rather our relationship with God is based on God's forgiveness of our sins. And this this is the good news. This is the heart of the gospel. Our sins are forgiven. Our relationship with God is restored. And in that we have a security. There's something solid now about our place within God's plan. Every time we confess our sins, every time we begin worship, really, we remember that we are imperfect. We remember that we have hurt people. It's the honest truth. And we remember 
that God forgives our sins and remembers our iniquities. This astonishing bit of honesty and of hope allows us to approach God with humility and gratitude. I hope that your sense of being a beloved child of God, you can bring to God your concerns, your brokenness, that we can be honest about our mistakes and our sins, that we can endeavor to act as ones who have the law written on our hearts, that we can be the church of God, the people of God in humility and gratitude. Let us look forward to Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem, to Jesus' last supper with his disciples. Let us fear the cost of God's love for us in Jesus' death on the cross. And let us anticipate the good news that he lives, so we live. Let us praise God in song. sooner be here together in worship. Please get your vaccines. If you have neighbors who need help getting a vaccine, help them. The faster and quicker that we're all vaccinated, the, the better chance we have of being healthy and safe. I want to pray for friends, family members who have COVID, who are ill, um, we had a difficult time so late in the game to come down with this terrible disease. So prayers be with you and those you love if you know someone who is struggling with COVID. Prayers continue to be with students and teachers 
as they push forward toward the end of this semester and what, a couple more months left, I'm sure teachers are exhausted and are ready for that short summer break, but God bless you. We appreciate what you are doing. Prayers be for the people of Atlanta, for Asian Americans who feel frightened. Prayers be for those who suffer from violence. Prayers be with Minneapolis during the slow trial of their children. Prayers be with all those who are are traumatized and re-traumatized by what they see on the news. Prayers of God for your world, for your creation. Prayers for springtime as floods drain and as farmers start to think about a new season. Let us pray. As Jesus taught us, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. All right, well, I'll see you next Sunday here on YouTube and hopefully right outside, right there. Go now in peace to love God, love others, and serve the world. Mm -hmm.